the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee? Or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in? Or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee, sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister, or excuse me. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in naked, and ye clothed me not sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst? or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life, eternal. Amen. After the way you treated me, that's the question I'm asking today. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, King Jesus, Lord, we love you so very much today. We're grateful, God, for the wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost that we do, in fact, feel in the house of the Lord today. As we sing the sacred songs of Zion, our hearts are made glad. Reminded, O oh God, that you abide with us, you abide in us. Master, if ever there has been a time in the life of your church when it is necessary for men and women of God to deliver a word from heaven, now is that time. We don't need man-made doctrine, we don't need man-made dogma. We need to hear from heaven, and I ask God today, that you would anoint me prophetically to declare the word of the Lord. Lord, today that I might declare, thus saith the Lord. And God, that every word that would proceed from my lips would be heaven sent and heaven anointed. Touch the heart and the hearing of every individual that right now is listening and those who will later listen by reason of the internet. Let our hearts and minds be prepared at this hour to receive the engrafted word of God. Let it not simply hit our eardrums and 
bounce off into the sunset, but let it become part of our living, part of our understanding, part of our revelation. We ask it all today in that mighty, wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. After the way you treated me. Well, I'll tell you, we live in an hour today when I'm shocked that Christian people have no discernment. They have no understanding whatsoever. They cannot, Johnny, today look at the life of someone and tell whether or not they're a believer, whether or not they're a child of God. Because there are those who claim to be children of God who are as hateful and as racist and as homophobic and as ugly as anybody can be. Amen. And these people are accepted. They're received by the church of the living God as being part of God's family because all of a sudden in 2020, these things are acceptable in the lives of Christian people. Got news for you? No, they're not. Nothing has changed. Jesus told us himself that you will know them by their fruit. The suggestion, I've preached on this in the past, the suggestion that a child of God cannot act like a child of God and still be a child of God is a false notion. If you're a child of God, you're going to act like one. That's right. And if you don't act like one, you are not one. Regardless of what you profess or what you claim, if your actions do not support your profession, then your profession is empty. My Lord have mercy. You know, we always have people in the church. I remember growing up as a kid, it seemed like one of our favorite pastimes in the Assemblies of God was sitting around trying to determine if Brother Smith or Brother Jones or, or Brother Ellis was going to make heaven or not. We constantly, I don't know if they did that in your Baptist church, Johnny, where people would sit back and judge, well, now so-and-so acted like this, or so-and-so did that, or so-and-so. I heard that they were involved in this activity, or that activity, or they went here, or they were seen with this person, or that person. Well, I'm going to tell you my Bible. Oh, if I heard one more people say, my Bible says. How many of us, you're watching online right now and you're thinking, yeah, I've heard that phrase a hundred times. My Bible says you can't get into heaven and do that. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yeah, your Bible says that, but you know what's funny? What your Bible never says is that anything you do is wrong. I remember I have a family member, an elderly family member. I've talked about this before, too. She said one day she was talking to a very legalistic lady in her church. She's part of the Holiness Church at the time. And this one member of her church was very legalistic, very judgmental, very harsh. And she was talking to this lady, and this lady... Uh, my aunt said something to her about, well, you know, the church of God doesn't believe in wearing makeup. And yet there are so many in the holiness church who wear foundation to even out their complexion, you know, to kind of make those little wrinkles fill in a little and to make some of those little freckles disappear, you know, just to, just to even out their complexion, Johnny, that's all. And she said, now where, my aunt said, now where do you buy that foundation? She said, I, I've been in a lot of stores and I've never seen it amongst the pancake mix. I've never seen it with the pickles or I've never seen it in the aisle alongside of, uh, you know, mustard and ketchup. She said, no, if you're going to buy that foundation, you got to go to the cosmetics department. 
She said, what do these women think? She said, cosmetic, if it's a cosmetic, it's a cosmetic. And if the church of God don't believe in wearing cosmetics, then why do they think it's okay to get away wearing that? Well, this very legalistic lady, boy, I mean, she got huffy and she said, well, 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 well Sister Overton, I can tell you right now, I wear foundation. But, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, lighten the bags under my eyes and blah, 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 blah. And my aunt said to her, well, you know what? She said, I, I haven't been in the church a whole long time, she said, but I sure have learned how to identify sin real quick. She said, there's an easy way to figure out what is sin and what isn't sin. And this lady said to her, well... Uh, what do you think? What's your opinion on that? And my aunt said, Sin is what I don't do. If I do it, then it ain't sin. But if I don't do it, it's sin. Hello now. It's that simple, Johnny. And a lot of Christians in our world today are of the mindset that what they don't do is sin and what they do do is not sin. I've said it many times, and I know I prickle a lot of pears when I say this, but it always amazes me how preachers can preach against gay and lesbian people, and yet, interestingly enough, they don't say a word about the fact that Jesus and the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, you know, they love to say, oh no, the New Testament, the New Testament condemns homosexuality. Hallelujah, glory to God. Read Romans 1. Read 1 Corinthians. They ignore the fact that Jesus and the Apostle Paul both identify an individual who is divorced and remarried as living as an adulterer or an adulteress. And that's what the Bible teaches, folks. You can paint it any way you want to paint it. That's what the Bible says. But they'll say, oh, but if you remarry, you know, your marriage is sacred in the eyes of God. Really? Uh, where in the Bible do you get that doctrine? Because I got news for you. Where it really came from is the Catholic Church, not from the Bible. This notion that marriage is this sacred institution. No, marriage is an institution. It is a contract. It is an agreement. It is a covenant that two people enter into. And God honors that contract and he holds you to your commitment. That's why the Bible said don't make a vow. Don't do it because if you make a vow, God will fully hold you to that vow. God takes your swearing by Him. You know, Mr. Senator, when you stand up there and say, I'm going to be an impartial judge in this impeachment hearing, so help me God. Got news for you, baby. The minute you utter those words, so help me God, you're in trouble. Because God will hold you to that pledge and to that vow. God does not take vows that invoke His name lightly. But see, sin is what I don't do. We got people that sit around judging other saints in the church. And that used to be our pastime, I'm telling you right now. Sometimes we'd sit and have a blast picking people apart and figuring out who was going to make heaven, who was backslid, and who was going to split hell wide open. Because after all, they did what I don't believe you ought to be able to do. I believe they're living what I believe you ought to be living, and therefore they're hell bound in a handbasket. Funny how we can ignore our own weaknesses and we can ignore our own faults and we can ignore our own sins. But my blessed God, we have 2020 vision when looking at everybody else. Amen. In Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, the Lord Jesus Christ expounds for us on exactly how a believer can miss heaven. Oh, my goodness. Tell 
tells us exactly how those who identify themselves as children of God can wind up missing the mark, Johnny, and not quite making it inside the pearly gate. Jesus expounds on it, Bill. This in Paul, this in Peter, this in John. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? His explanation doesn't have a thing in the world to do with their sexual orientation. It doesn't have a thing in the world to do with whether they drink or not. It doesn't have a thing in the world to do with whether or not they lay down with prostitutes. It doesn't have a thing in the world to do with whether they live their life as a transgendered man or a transgendered woman. No, it had to do with the way that they treated others. Well, I'll tell you a little secret, my friend. If you think Christianity, like Judaism, which came before it, if you think Christianity doesn't have a great deal to do with how you treat other people, you are so mistaken, it's not even funny. The Christian life is to be marked by good deeds and good actions and righteous conduct. Am I telling the truth? Amen. If we're a child of God, we ought to know how to treat others. And the Lord went down a list of things. He said, you know, those that I'm going to reward are those who saw me when I was hungry, who saw me when I was thirsty, who saw me when I was in prison, or when I was a stranger, which, by the way, the term stranger literally means an alien, someone not from your country. That's what the term stranger literally translates, okay? You saw me as an outsider. I wasn't even from your country. I may not even have spoken your language. And you know what? You took me in. You befriended me. You ministered to me. You met my need. You responded to my circumstance. And the Word of God calls those who have done this thing, listen, righteous. In verse 37, uh, well, let me go back a little bit. In verse uh, 35, he said, For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Now listen. Then shall the righteous answer. What does righteous mean? It means to do right. So those who did right answer the Lord. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee, or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto me? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for them which despitefully use you. Oh man, I'm going to tell you, He's got a high standard. He expects us to treat one another pretty well, doesn't he? And I've got news for you, friend. If you think you're not going to be held to that standard, you are diluting yourself. You're kidding yourself. Because Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 25 makes it abundantly clear that one day everyone who identifies as a child of God is going to answer for this conduct. Don't tell me you prayed for me when I was hungry. Because that's not what Jesus said was right. He said, I was hungry and what did you do? You fed me. I was thirsty and what did you do? You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was in prison and you came to me. I'm going to tell you something, honey. Talk is cheap and God don't play cheap. 
He expects his people to live the life, not merely to talk the talk. In the second chapter of the book of James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, the literal half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, James said, if you see your brother naked or destitute of daily food, if you see him in need, said, and all you do is pat him on the back, I'm paraphrasing, you pat him on the back and say, boy, I'm praying for you, brother. Be filled, be clothed. Oh, bless the Lord, may his needs be met. James said, nevertheless, you do nothing to meet that need. He said, your faith without works is dead. Your prayer goes as high as the ceiling, Johnny. God don't hear it because God in, in empty words. God doesn't respond to empty words. What God expects his people to do is to respond to need. To respond to negative circumstances and situations. I've gotten myself into trouble over the years, I guess. I'll say it that way. I got a minister friend years ago. He tried, he was trying to help me because I was struggling and struggling and struggling to build a church. Uh, I, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of money. And... I think my battery's died. And he turned around and... No, it, yeah, it did. And he told me, he said, Brother, I'm going to get you invited into some churches. said, I have friends that are pastoring churches and they'd be more than happy to have you come in and preach for them. He said, and... They're going to give you a love offering, and that love offering will help you to support yourself. It will help you to meet your needs and to do what you need to do. He said, but now here's the deal. Before I take you into that church, he said, before I take you into that church, I was pretty good for preacher, keep preaching while he changed. Change of batteries, huh? <laughs> Tell you, I'm a professional. <laughs> he said, before I take you into any one of these churches to preach, he said, I'm going to take your wallet. I'm going to take your credit cards. I'm going to take your checkbook. I'm going to take your change purse. He said, I'm going to make sure you don't go in there with a single dime in your pocket. And I looked at him and I said, well, brother, why in the world would you feel the need to do all that? He said, I'll tell you why. Because you are the most compassionate, giving man I've ever met in my life. He said, as sure as I'm alive, they'll give you a love offering and you'll turn around and you'll just give it right back in one form or another. That's what he told me. So one of the churches he got me invited into was this little black church and. Pennsylvania little probably had about 30 people not a whole lot of people they had a little building of their own it was a converted office building had a little sanctuary it probably said about a hundred maybe but they only had about 30 people and they collected a nice little love offering it come out to about fifty dollars and they handed it to me at the end of the service and then the pastor got up in the pulpit and she began to explain to the congregation. She said, folks, the roof on our church is needing repair. And I had the repairman come out and price it. And it's going to cost us about, I forget how much, say $1,200, $1,500, some dollars, you know. It's a good deal of money. She said, now, I know y'all give, and I know y'all do the best you can. She said, but I really need everybody to help me every way they can so we can get this job done. And I reached in my pocket, and I took that $50 she had just handed to me not even five minutes ago. And I said, sister, I want to start your offering out today with this money that you gave me for preaching. I said, let that go toward your roof. We left the church that day and the preacher who had brought me there to preach said, See, he said, that's exactly what I was afraid of. He said, that's exactly what I know you just as sure as I'm alive. You'll get the shirt off your back. 
I said, yeah, I will. You know why, brother? Because I believe God. I believe the promise of God. I believe when the word of God said, Give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. I believe God honors his word and he keeps his word. I said, and you know what? If I didn't have faith to back up what I was doing, I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But everything I do, Johnny, I do in faith. Everything, when somebody in the church, I'm not going to mention names because I'm not trying to do that. Somebody in the church needs a new alternator for their truck. And they don't have the money for that alternator. I don't have the money for the alternator either. But thank God the Lord's blessed me with good credit. So I got a couple credit cards and I see a need. I said, you know what, I can meet that need. Now, I can either pat you on the back and say, well, brother, I'm praying for you, which would have accomplished nothing. Or I can say, let's go across the street to O'Reilly's and get you an alternator. And then, of course, we go across the street to O'Reilly's, and O'Reilly said, well, now, there's two different ones for this truck. We're not sure which one uh, fits because the, the, the nuts and bolts configuration is different. I said, well, then give us both of them, and we'll figure out which one works, and we'll bring the other one back, right? Anybody that knows this preacher, I don't have, I don't have a problem in the world saying this. Anybody knows this preacher knows if I can meet a need, by God, I'm going to meet that need. And if I can't, I'm going to go to God and pray with every ounce of sincerity I've got that God finds a way to meet that need. Because I believe in action. I can't stand people who talk the talk. We've got churches today full of people who talk the Christian talk. They use the lingo. They use the language of Christianity. But brother, when it comes to living this thing, they don't even know where to begin. They don't even know where to start. They don't know how to treat other people. They don't know how to respond to a need that exists. You know what? The way I look at it is this. And I remember telling somebody this years ago who asked me, said, how in the world do you operate when, when you constantly are giving and helping people and doing for people and you ain't got it? Right now, you can't drive for Lyft. You can't drive for Uber. You don't make a living from the church. How in the world can you do the things you do? I said, well, you see, what I do have is what John and Peter had when they showed up at the gate of the temple and that little beggar man said to them, hey, y'all got something you can help me with? And Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold have I none. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's been many a time I've had to look at somebody and say, honey, I'm sorry, but I'm broke. Hello now. Silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I've got faith to believe God. And that faith is demonstrated every day in dozens of ways by my actions, not by my prayers. Hello? Tommy and I have been together 18 years. He grew up Jehovah's Witness. I guarantee you, 18 years ago, he thought I was about half nuts. When he saw the way I did things, when he saw, didn't you, booby? You did. You know you did. You might as well just admit it. He thought I was about half crazy. But you see, I knew that if I would just do what God's called me to do, and that is, he's called me to live this thing, not talk it, but live it. When we had a young lady in the church, I've told this story before. A young lady visited our church. She was driving a beautiful little Mustang. And while she was visiting our church and had her car parked, we were meeting at the time over there at the LGBT Community Center in Oklahoma. She had parked her car on one of the side streets. And after church, we went out to eat. I think we're at that little pizza joint there on uh, Cedar Springs. And after a while, she went to her car, and we were walking to where our cars were at. 
And don't you know, somebody had knocked out the window in her car and stolen something off of her front seat. And all oh, she was so upset and she was so disturbed. And I felt so terrible about it. And I had her visitor's card because we ask people to fill out a visitor's card. This might let you know if you ever visit our church and you fill out a visitor's card, believe me, it, it's to your advantage. We went home that day and I said to Tommy, I said, you know, this was that young lady's first visit ever to our church and I don't want her to be scared away from coming to church because some fool knocked out the window in her car. I said, I've got to get that window repaired. I've got to get that window fixed. Did I have the money to do that? No, but I had a way to do it. You don't always have to have the money to do it, but if you got a way to do it. <laughs> so I contacted her, and I found out where she was at. She was at work. She'd be there for several hours. I contacted Safe Light Auto, and I made an appointment for them to go out to her workplace and to get in touch with her, and I paid for the repair with the credit card over the phone, and they went out to her job, and they replaced that window for her, and it didn't cost her nothing. That way, she wouldn't be discouraged from coming. We never saw her again. She never come back to church. But I put $160-something dollars into getting that window replaced because I'm going to tell you something. I don't want anybody to be discouraged from coming to church over somebody acting the fool. And you know how easy it can be sometimes for people to get discouraged. Do I regret doing that? Not for a million dollars. Not in a million years. I'm going to tell you something. God paid me back so many times over I can't even count. I've had people bless me. I had a man I've known for years and years and years. We contacted me years ago, and he's a couple of years ago, and he said, Charles, I want to help you pay down your debt. I want to help you get your debt paid. He said, I'll tell you why, because I know half of it you used helping other people do things and helping people get stuff and getting stuff for the church, which I do. I, I can't help it. If the church needs something, then I'll go out and get it. Because by God, we're going to have what we need if, if it kills me. See, a lot of preachers get up and preach, Oh, the Lord will bless you, the Lord will bless you, as long as the check you're writing has their address on it. Am I telling the truth? I'm here to tell you, the Lord will bless you, the Lord will bless you, regardless of whose address is on it and whose name is on the check, regardless of who you're blessing or who you're doing for. But God has called us to do not merely to pray. He's called us to action, not merely to speak. In 1 John 12, verse 29, the Word of God said, If ye know that He is righteous, speaking of Jesus, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of Him. What did He call those? who fed the hungry, who gave water to those who were thirsty, who visited those who were in prison, who ministered to the sick. He called them the righteous, didn't he? Amen. Honey, I'm here to tell you today, there's a whole world of people out there in America who call themselves Christians, but their conduct does not support that claim. And if their conduct does not support that claim, then their claim is null and void. Because everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And conversely, if they don't do righteousness, if they don't do right, then they're not born of him, regardless of their claim to a born-again experience. Is it okay that I said that? Righteousness in this passage in the original Greek means a state of him who is as he ought to be. Righteousness is the condition which is acceptable to God. It involves integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness of thinking, Feeling and acting. 
In a narrower sense, it refers to justice or the virtue which gives each his due. But righteousness has to do with doing right. Amen. It has to do with action. In 1 John 3 and verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, meaning Jesus, is righteous. 1 John 3 verse 10 says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, listen, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Now, how hard is that to figure? You know what that tells me? That tells me half the TV preachers in America today are not of God. Oh, my goodness. Mm. I'm going to tell you something. When you can get up in front of your audience and brag that you're a billionaire, as Kenneth Copeland does, yeah, I said the name, and you can brag that you're a billionaire, i got news for you, honey. If I had those kind of resources, there wouldn't be a person in my church or a person in my community that lacked for nothing. And I guarantee you, if you'd minister and act the way you're supposed to act and do the way you're supposed to do and respond to needs the way you're supposed to respond to needs, instead of having one billion in the bank, God would probably have five billion in your bank. Because the more you give, the more God gives back. But isn't it funny that these preachers who brag about their wealth and brag about their prosperity and brag about how God has blessed them, very seldom do you hear anyone brag about how giving and how compassionate and how uh, charitable they are. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. See, I said under a pastor that I talk about all the time that I love dearly. I count him as probably the greatest spiritual and ministerial influence I've ever had in my life. Brother J.T. Gillum of the Riverside Church of God. I love Brother Gillum. And I'm going to tell you something. I watched Brother Gillum year after year after year. One of the most giving, generous men you've ever seen in your life. His church didn't pay him a whole lot of salary back in the day. The church of God has a scale. I don't know how they do things today, but back in the day, they had a scale. And based on the membership of your church, that determined what your maximum salary was. And I'm not kidding. If you had a church with 500 people you reached the apex of the scale. And if you had a church like one preacher did, who later became the general overseer of the church of God, that had over 50,000 members, you still got the same pay as the pastor who had 500 members. See, don't tell me all preachers are in it for money. Don't tell me we're all out there and all we're after is money. That's a bunch of crock of nonsense. Because it didn't matter whether you had 500 members or you had 50,000 members. Once you hit 500 members, that was the highest pay you were going to get. Because the Church of God believed that was the most any preacher needed to live on. Brother Gillum only had a couple hundred members in his church. Maybe two or three hundred total. And his salary was not <laughs> so spectacular at all. But God blessed him. He had a son-in-law who was a builder, a very talented builder. And over the years, Brother Gillum was able to very wisely make use of his little bitty salary. And he bought some rental properties over the years, Johnny. And his son-in-law, being a builder, was able to help him fix them up, you know, and do it at a much cheaper cost, obviously, than it would cost him to do otherwise. <laughs> And by the time I met Brother Gillum, Brother Gillum had a, a mini rental property. I say mini. I think he had about five or six rental homes that he owned. And he rented them out. And you know, he'd see an emergency on television where a family got burned out of their house. 
and their house burned down, and this poor family with three kids, four kids, and Brother Gillen would call them up, and he'd say, listen, I've got a house over here, and he'd give them the address, and he'd say, if you come, he said, I'll give you the keys, and I'll give you a six-month lease for free. You won't have to pay anything for six months. So you can try to get back on your feet. And he used to do stuff like this all the time. He told me one time when the church was having a... I was just a teenager living in Texas on my own. And Brother Gillum, the, the church was having a yard sale. You know, a big, big yard sale. And uh, there were a bunch of men's suits out there. And Brother Gillum told me, he said, Chuck, if you see any suits here, son, that you can wear, or any shoes or any clothing that you can use... He said, you go ahead and take it. He said, when you got everything together, he said, go to the ladies and just tell them that Brother Gillum said that you could have these things. So I did, and the ladies wrote down everything that I took. And after a little while, you know what I saw? I saw Brother Gillum going over there and looking that bill over and reaching into his wallet and pulling out the money. The yard sale wasn't just giving that stuff away. He was going to pay for it himself. On my behalf. That's what we call living this thing. Amen. John, 1 John 3.10 In this the children of God are manifest. In the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God. Neither is he that loveth not his brother. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. The Word of God tells us, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm not preaching today that you make heaven because you do good things. I'm not saying today that God is, allows us to be saved by reason of good works. No, the Word of God tells us plainly it's by grace we're saved. And that is through faith, and it has nothing to do with works. But once you claim to be born again, then righteous conduct, right conduct, ought to be, has to be, manifested in your life to support your claim to being born again. My goodness, born-again person cannot be hateful. A born-again person cannot be spiteful. A born-again person cannot be malicious because it's not in the born-again nature to be that way. Am I telling the truth? Got news for you, honey. A born-again person cannot be racist. A born-again person cannot be homophobic. A born-again person cannot be xenophobic. A born-again person cannot act in those ways because those things are contrary to a born-again life experience. Anybody that's truly been born again, my God have mercy, I'll tell you. I remember in the church of God up in New England, things are different in New England where I come from than they are down here in the South. Down here in the South, a lot of your churches are still pretty segregated. And I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I just love putting my foot in my mouth and getting into trouble. But don't you people of color look at white folks and say, yeah, the church is segregated in the South because of you people. Because no, it's as much your fault as it is anybody's. I've had more people of color I know that, well, you know, I like the way we worship in the black church. I like the way we do things in the black church, you know. I'm not crazy about the way you do things in the white church, so-called. Well, that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. If you, you know, if you like a certain worship style and what have you, and a certain church ministers to that, I don't have a problem with that. But don't sit there and claim that segregation is all because of the other guy. Am I telling the truth? There we go. Now I'm gonna have people write me online and give me, give me the riot act. But see, up in the Northeast, the Pentecostal church has always been different. 
Ever since I was a kid, Johnny, when I was a kid, we had people of color in my church. We had Asian people. We had Hispanic people. I was so accustomed to a mixed congregation that I, when I came down south and you had so-called white churches, black churches, I was like, what in the world is that? What is that mess about? I didn't grow up that way. I grew up where we all worship together, where we all, man, when the Church of God in southern New England has camp meeting, man, I mean to tell you, we have church and we have a time. Some of them choirs from the Haitian churches or the Jamaican churches, because up north we got a lot of different groups of people, you know, and we had churches that were predominantly Haitian or predominantly Jamaican. And man, I mean to tell you, those choirs that get up and they get to sing in a camp meeting, and all us folk, black, white, and otherwise, would shout and run the aisles and dance and have church. And my, we enjoyed the presence of God. Because there's no room for racism in the church of the living God. There's no room for racism. In the life of a born again believer. I'm going to tell you something else Trump worshipers. There shouldn't be a Christian in this world. Who can even stomach a racist. Racism offends me. Xenophobia offends me. Being afraid of people who come from foreign lands. People who come from other places. That offends me. That deeply offends me. Well, I'll tell you something. This country is in for a whole big butt whipping. We are. When we got people who travel thousands of miles and you have no idea the perils they face during those travels to come to the southern border of the United States of America, which in their mind, Bill, is the next best thing to heaven. They think they're going to heaven. And when they get there, they find out they're in hell because all of a sudden their babies are thrown into cages and mom and dad are separated from their children. And never again in this lifetime will they see those kids. Don't tell me we got a Christian president. Don't, don't even tell me that. No, because herein are the righteous and the evil identified. Those that do right are his kids. Those that do not are his kids. Am I telling the truth today? And honey, you can spin it any way you want to spin it, but that's the word of God. Word of God declares today in Titus almost done. 3, 1 through 7, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness, self-control unto all men. For we ourselves also were, meaning past tense, sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Paul said, uh, the, Titus tells us, this is how we used to be, he said. But after, the, after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared toward, uh, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus tells us we ourselves also were foolish, 
disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Oh, I'm here to tell you today, these things are inconsistent with someone who has genuinely been born again. I read an article this week about this big rally that was held in Miami, Florida. The occupant in the White House had a big Evangelicals for Trump rally. And there was a man who's been a lifelong evangelical and he attended this rally and he said he was disgusted by what he saw. He said it was the most horrible thing I've ever witnessed in my life. He said it was not at all different from any rally that's conducted by this man. He said he stood up there and spewed lies and half-truths and the audience sat there and cheered him on and shouted and screamed and hollered and supported him and this fellow said you know I was just shocked I couldn't believe what I was seeing well it's because the people in that room who identify as evangelicals are in fact I'm going to say it today are in fact not even born again because if they were born again they couldn't possibly act that way if they were born again, they could not possibly cheer someone who separates children from their parents at the border. People who have come to this country seeking help and seeking rest, seeking an opportunity to achieve. If you look at the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt make no idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Then you get to number five. Honor thy father and your mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Do not covet. Out of the Ten Commandments, the first four are related to man's relationship with God. And the last six are related to man's relationship with one another. Oh, if you know anything about the Jewish law, then you understand that God had a lot to say about how we treat one another. You'd see that God had a lot to say about Israel as a nation making sure that the sick and the infirmed and those who were widowed and those who were orphaned were well taken care of. You would see that God made certain that the poorest among us had provision made for them. Even to the extent that the law of Moses did not allow a Jew to fully harvest his crops. They had to leave something on the vine, Johnny. The Lord said, no, when you harvest, he said, you purposely leave stuff out there. You leave it on the vine. You let it continue to grow so that the poor can come and they can harvest and they can get something to eat. You want to leave something on the vine so that those who are less fortunate among us have an opportunity to also share in your good fortune. Am I telling the truth today? Don't tell me America is a nation built on Christian principle. I know better than that. I'm not stupid. I know what the Word of God says. If America were a nation built on Christian principle, I'm going to tell you something right now, folks. We would be taking care of the poor. We'd be taking care of the needy. There'd be no lack. There'd be no want. Am I telling the truth today? Oh, I'm going to tell you, it's ridiculous the claims that are made as they relate to the conduct of those making those claims. I've heard Christians say, and I'm trying to shut up, but this is a subject that really eats my crawl a little bit. I've heard Christians talk about Christian people. Well, bless God, I don't want my taxes paying for some so-and-so, and I don't want my taxes going for that. And bless God, I paid for my own education, so let the other guy pay for his. 
The other guy may not have the same opportunities that you have. The other guy may not have the same things available to him that you had available to you. I'm going to tell you something. As somebody who grew up in an environment where we were psychologically and emotionally crippled as kids, yes, I said it. I understand that there are people in our world today, Johnny, who they may have all kind of stuff available to them, but you know what? They never know it. And what are those people supposed to do? Those people are supposed to suffer because they grew up with parents who never encouraged them to even think about college, who never encouraged them to go to college, who never told them about uh, avenues whereby they could attend college. These kids don't know anything about getting a scholarship. These kids don't know anything about getting grants. These kids haven't got a clue about loans, but I guess they're just supposed to suffer because after all, mom and dad worked in factories and mom and dad worked in blue collar work and they didn't understand how all this works. So these these kids just should go without. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Don't tell me everybody has the same opportunities in this country because no, they don't. No, they don't. And I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of stuff might be sitting right in front of a lot of kids, but they've been beaten down and abused by abusive parents, and they've been made to believe they can't do nothing, they can't be nothing, they can't achieve nothing. And John, even though it's right in front of them, they don't feel like they have the ability or they have the uh, wherewithal to accomplish or achieve. Don't tell me we all have the same footing. We all have the same level playing field. Because that isn't so. I'm here to tell you today, according to Jesus in Matthew 25, the day of judgment is going to come. A day of reckoning is going to come. And the Lord's going to say to those who did right. And how did he identify those who did right? People who lived this thing, not just talked it. People who responded to needs, who didn't just pray about them. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. and he's going to say to those that did right, all right, you come to your reward. But honey, those that did not do right, those who in fact were only Christian in proclamation and in their own mind, but they didn't know how to do right, those, the Word of God says, are going to wind up in the devil's hell. They're going to wind up in the same place as the lost. Why? Well, it's simple. It's very simple. Not because God's going to condemn some Christians and save other Christians. No, it's because they were never Christians to begin with. The problem is we live in a world where People assume and accept when somebody identifies as a Christian, we accept that they are in fact a Christian. Right? Somebody says, I'm a Christian. We say, okay. And then when they act like a devil, we say, boy, they're a bad Christian. No, they're not. They're not a Christian at all. Hmm. Am I telling the truth? My yeah. Lord, have mercy. Might as well tell it plain today. Folks, listen, we're living in an hour right now where the church is being shaken. And the bad fruit has fallen to the ground. There's a lot of people clinging to the tree, claiming to be Christians, but they're not truly plugged into the vine. They're really not, in fact, part of the tree at all. Am I telling the truth today? There are going to be some people stand before the Lord. I'm closing right now. Some people are going to stand before the Lord. And they're going to say, well, Lord, why can't I get into heaven? I don't understand why you're not welcoming me with the sheep. And the Lord's going to look at them and say, after the way you treated me, 